You know, so, why, why don't you tell us, I mean, what you had some small nuances that you had to do to make your life better in lateral surgery? What have you found? What have you done? Great point. Okay. So let's start with the L45, which is actually a great job. You canceled my lab. Well done. <laughs> you were so good. Uh, <laughs> Same lab. You did a great job. <laughs> There's nothing left to do. But anyway, uh, but I think with the crest, that crest that you showed, Zach, that was a favorable crest. I think that's one of the challenges of L4-5. How do you navigate with the crest? I think, again, it's not CME. The two-bed retractor has really helped me because of two things. One is with the three-blade, if you hug in the crest and you open, no matter what you do, you're going to push against the crest. You push against the crest, it pushes you up. With two-blade retractor, once you land on the disc, you open, you open along the disc. You are not dealing with the crest. Um, and if you are, let's say you're using a three blade retractor, what you could do is uh, you have your shim in the posterior blade, you don't deploy it. And then you check an AP, you mallet it in. Once you're in the disc, you use it as a pivoting point, and then you can push against the crest a little bit to neutralize it so you maintain your orthogonality. I think the nuance is all about how do you maintain orthogonal angle to the disc? Uh, how do you navigate or map the uh, plexus? And then you have to have some sort of a workflow to minimize your retraction time. Go ahead, yeah, Dr. Just, Taylor. Uh, I would, I would actually think, I would actually go back to like at your skin incision and I would go back to the dissection because I find a lot of people that get down to four or five, I dissect right down on top of the iliac crest. Yes, actually, I, I hug, yeah, I yeah. use a bow to release those That's muscles. That's exactly what I do I, too. I, um, the skin mark tells you where the disc is, but I hug the pelvis. You don't want to... Uh, be short of that. But so that's one of the things I would say, the maintaining orthogonality and then uh, mapping the plexus. I think, again, Zach mentioned this. You want to get to the point that you are low numbers in the back, high numbers in the front. I also don't think the exact numbers matter. You're looking for the gradient. I think the specific number, it's, it's just an internal reference for how that patient is simulating. Uh, and I don't have a magic number. I would say maybe like a five milliamp difference is safe, um, but it has to be low number posteriorly. Uh, so your lumbar plexus is behind you. Um, you don't want to retract it anteriorly. Um, hey, you know, can I add on the two blade retractor? Of course, five? yes. Uh, I think it's really favorable to dock in the anterior blade on the yes. front um, of the disc space. You're much Bring it less posterior. likely to have plexus issues mm -hmm. that way. Uh, and if you, uh, I'm going to add to that a little bit more. So if I don't get a good numbers in L4-5, uh, again, with, with, with the two-blade, even a three-blade, the idea is to go more and more anterior and maybe a little bit higher because the nerve, ha nerve has a curve that uh, the safest area would be to go in front and top and then bring it obliquely <coughs> down to center on the, on the disc with a two-blade retractor, you can also walk it back. I've done this before. There you go anterior, and then you walk this back, and then you put your shim in. Now, Nima, is it, is it prone lateral or direct lateral, uh, or does it matter? It's, it's the same thing. I don't think, I think, it, yeah. I think it could go for both. I mean, would you, I would you change what you do if it's prone lateral as opposed to a direct lateral? Do I change what I do? In um, terms of placing the retractor? No. It's the same thing. You do, it's eventually it's, the same thing. Ultimately, yeah. What about pre-op? I mean, what can you tell tell everyone pre-op? How do you decide it's going to be a problem or not? I mean, Louis sort of talked about a little bit about the blood supply. Do you look at this vasculature? Do you Is look it at a what problem do you in do? terms of L four? Well, I tell you why. Well, in the past, we had made such a big fuss about the crest and the height of the crest and all that stuff. Um, I don't know. Is that still valid? Do you guys look at that? What do you look at pre-op? Honestly, knows? I. This, this sounds strange. I don't even look at the crest anymore. With two-blade retractor, I don't think it matters. The other thing about two-blade retractor is good is you have a, a flexible cone that you work through. With a three-blade, you essentially have a rigid uh, cylinder. You have to, you, you're, you're obliged to go between those three blades. With the two-blade, you can go at an angle. So that's actually your angled instrument. You, I, I never use an angled instrument with a two-blade. 
Any, what do you guys think, Dr. Taylor? Rarely. Sometimes rarely, very rarely. Yeah, we, don't need, we don't need to use even because your instrument angle, can come at an angle between the blades, so you can go exactly. That's side. what I mean. It's, it's you have a flexible working zone as opposed to this rigid. There's a limit where you will hit the bar, but fair. But, but I think it's, one of the greatest rare, changes yeah. that I've seen in a lot, what over 23, 24 years we've been doing, we really have, like you said, moved away from the crust and how high the crust is. And you're right, it actually is a material. It, it does come back to the vascular anatomy. It pretty much yes, dictates sir, yep. where that crust is. And you look at the MRI and vascular anatomy, you can pretty much predict it's going to happen or not happen. And then, like you said, you use these tricks to get away from it. Yes. But you plan before. Otherwise, yes. you shouldn't be getting into a case and get stuck in the middle and then say, the crest is in my way. Mm -hmm. That should have been pre or planned. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's, that's the message, I guess, I would like to say. You shouldn't get in there and get stuck. I think as Dr. Taylor mentioned this, it's like each level is different. Uh, you can apply the L3, the L3 4 is probably the easiest one. You can apply the L3-4 concepts to L4-5. L4-5 is obviously the hardest one because of the crest, because of the nerve and all that. Um, but that's kind of what I wanted to discuss. Some of those things you can't really show in a cadaver. You can't show mapping in a cadaver. But in, in terms uh, of sim now, like Zach talked about anterior yeah. docking, I think you said posterior docking. Does it so matter blade, what do you do? With a two blade, I think you have an option to go anterior. That will save you. That's the idea of sim before shim. If you go anterior, I don't even think you need to sim before you shim because there's no way the nerve will be there. Uh, obviously, assuming that you mapped it correctly. Can you uh, use both shims on both sides? Or I, just I, almost always use, I always use anterior and usually use two uh, if the channel of my discography is not big enough for a 22 cage, I'll pull one of them right before I insert. But usually I just work between them. You actually, you actually For, don't even need to pull the retractor to make it bigger. You just expand it and it'll open up and up. So you only need an 18 opening to put a 22 cage in. So just stick with but, 18 and everything for the most part. And then the last thing you do is um, open it up a couple of clicks and you get a 22 cage in. You know I'm saying I had two shims in, and so the cage literally couldn't fit between the shims. So I would just pull out the shim only. Oh, I see. Like, yes. Just, just to make enough room in there. Because I don't want to blow it apart. Yeah, but if you open it up a little bit, it'll expand just enough to put the cage in. Yeah. But again, this with is the, with the prone Martin. I, with the prone, I put two shims in because I need the stability. I actually put two stiff shims sometimes if if I really want it to be stay. Always really two stiff shims. In. Because of the prone, uh, yeah, with the prone position, gravity, at that stage of the surgery, gravity working against you. So you want the stabilization. And you're at an angle, it's a little precarious, you're trying to move quickly. Exactly. But again, again this, is, this is, I just want everyone to understand, what we're discussing is specific to a specific procedure. You're right. Because yes. there's a lot of laterals also done with a two-blade retractor Correct. that goes superior inferior. Correct. Rather than expanding along the disc. So you can expand along the disc, which is what you're describing, which is mm -hmm. fine. Or you can expand, you know, on the vertebral body up and down, which is another way of doing it, right? Correct. And there's no shim used in that. I know people use pins to dock on the body. Mm -hmm. And I've gone away from that, but I don't know if people still do that because you don't want that pin in the vertebral body to hold the blade down. I've seen someone get the segmental of that. So it's sort of, I've gone away. So there's so many nuances, I think, we sort of learned over time to get over yeah. there, right? I think the third is opening the blades too. At least when you go body to body, don't open a whole lot. I've seen people open the whole blade all yeah, the way yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. That's how we get your segmental. Just see the disc. Mm -hmm. So I like the disc expansion. Yeah, along the Just disc. see the disc. You don't need to see anything else. That's exactly. all you need to see. So it's the small things, I guess. Um, if you want it, open the incision. Stop struggling through a small incision. Not a big deal. Sometimes <laughs> skin's in the way. Open yeah. it up. Well, else, guys? I don't know. That's become such a common procedure now. I think it's become bread and butter for everybody. What about young guys? Anyone have questions on the technique? You'd like to know? You're stuck somewhere? You'd like to know something you guys should be asking? Uh, I right kind of. Time, then? <laughs> I brought this question up to Dr. Pimenta just in passing last evening, but you know, we often talk about the retractors. You know, using shims to make sure the retractors aren't drifting. Um, getting the stiffest kind of construct to hold the retractor. But now, what are your guys' utilization of robotics to hold the retractor? And uh, I haven't seen it yet myself, but the new kind of pneumatic arms, things like that. What are your thoughts on that, since that seems to be a big part of keeping this procedure safe? 
So I can I can tell you the pneumatic arm because I've I've used that I think pretty much more than anyone and it actually works really well. The problem is you need two hands to work it because you depress it Release. and it's not like you can open up, move it, and then tighten it. So you have to move it and depress it, and it it really it sags just a little bit after you use it. But once it's in position, it it holds really well. So I actually do really like the pneumatic arm. I would tell you I've I've tried to use the robot back and forth. I would tell you that if you want to pass the first dilator, it's a long pass with the robot. And then the second thing is you really need a separate fascial incision because you're not going to be able, you have to put the actuator right down on top of the skin. And so you have to have a separate fascial incision to at least put your finger on the first dilator to make sure you know where you're at. So I would pinpoint a spot with a robot and, and go to it. But the reality is, I think that navigation in that case is going to be better. And the last step is people talk about um, navigating the retractor, but the key thing is not navigating the retractor, it's navigating the two shims that you put in, and that's why two shims are gonna become even more important when you're navigating. So you navigate the shims that are in there, and that tells you where you're at, which I think is gonna be the critical piece, not the retractor. Is there an option in the industry that you can navigate the shim? Not yet? Not no. at the moment. <laughs> Next year. Is that yeah, Next fine. year. Okay, so I figured. I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. navigating the sim. <laughs> okay. Uh, Sounds like you're predicting the future, <laughs> Dr. Taylor. To your comment about the robot holding the retractor, um, the, you know, I, I don't necessarily do that. You know, in Olaf, you don't really um, hold it there. But I have asked because there, there are some robotic systems that hold the retractor. Those robotic systems are ground mounted. So the concerns that, because I've asked that same question, the concerns that, was, that were answered to me is that oftentimes you may want to rotate the bed. So if you tell anesthesia, hey, can you rotate the bed a little bit, and you forget, then that's the issues. And so um, the people that I've talked with have moved away from that, even though it's a nice, you know, rigid system. But at least with the pneumatic arm, it's attached to the yeah. bed. So it's attached to the bed, which is really nice. And if, if you look back, Depew actually made, remember their, uh, their robot arm that they had that nobody used was like 10 years ago? It was actually really good. It was just a rigid mm. instrument holder. Yeah. That, that you would put in place, much like a pneumatic arm. And I do think that's really critical. Uh, and the pneumatic arm works works really well. You can adjust it wherever you want. And then, um, but the reality is you want to work orthogonally, um, but in initially, you're sort of going to be usually at an angle, especially when you're talking about four or five. So you're at an angle to start, everything gets put in, and then you want to translate it up to, to 90 degrees. Uh, and that's really navigation that tells you that. But you can easily do that with a pneumatic arm. Yeah, and, and the, the arm is another way to make it as rigid as yeah. possible. Because uh, we use yeah, you know, a uh, retractor, two blade retractor in a single piece because it's lighter. It's not only because it's nicer to go from anterior to posterior, it's lighter. Uh, you saw uh, you mm -hmm. struggling with this big, heavy retractor <laughs> with an arm that is long, so uh, it's much easier to move with gravity yeah. with mm -hmm. a three-blade retractor. We learned this yeah. early on, so uh, choosing you know, a two-blade retractor, lighter, fixing with two shims, and adding a very strong uh, arm, mechanical arm, uh, so uh, automatic arm, but that is a plus to the rigidity and, and better for navigation. Yeah, the critical thing too was shortening the length of the arm or retractor because everyone makes it long because they want it to reach over the table, the top, but that's why I asked, someone asked earlier, where do you put the arm? So I put the, that one on ipsilateral just below and the arm, if you notice, um, but the prone system is really short, and that helps with the rigidity more than anything mm -hmm. else because it lessens the lever arm. All right, guys, we got some lunch. Anyone get hungry? Lunch break. Let's go. We're back here at uh, 12:45. Yeah.